Can you hear me okay? The setup? No? Uh, there we go. Here we go. Should go now. Much better. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I hope that you'll find this interesting. Um, so it's great. I know you've been, t I love coming to these conferences. I get to learn about things that I really don't know much about. And now I know a little bit more about elbow. In fact, I think I, think I might have a little bit going on as well. So it's always good to be here. All right, so just a little bit of conflict of interest. I don't have any major conflicts of interest to, uh, to talk about. The only thing is I am one of the original developers of Impact, which I will talk about a little bit today, but no longer have any interest in the um, software at all. Um, what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about what I do. Um, we're not gonna talk about diagnosing a concussion. This is all after the fact. Uh, so I do want to talk about how I go about my evaluations and what I'm doing to try to help the players get better. Um, my whole point is I do believe that the concussions are treatable. And what we can do is get them back to doing their normal activities, whether it's school, whether it's work, a little bit quicker than just resting them um, and doing things like that. So what we're going to talk about are these seven points um, in terms of a trajectory and getting them back. Um, one of my favorite slides is this one right here. And what you have is a whole cycle of doctors looking at a concussion. And what you can see is that they're all looking at the elephant differently. And, and that's part of my point is, is concussions are much more than just a brain injury. Uh, it's a big part of it, but it's more than that. And I think if you're really going to get into this and try to start treating concussions, then you have to understand of a multimodal or, or looking at multiple components of the concussion in order to take care of it a little bit better. A lot of this started back in 2015 with a meeting in Pittsburgh where we started to kind of get together, talk about it a little bit more and decide how we were going to approach concussions to, to get them um, treated and get people back to their normal activities quicker. Um, and here's kind of a, an overview or a schematic of all of that. And there are these risk factors that are associated with concussions that we do deal with a little bit. And then you're gonna have the concussive event, and then we're gonna have these seven different areas that we're going to evaluate and decide what we need to treat with a concussion. Um, it's a lot, but uh, there are ways of doing it relatively quickly, and I think um, well enough to, to start the treatment process pretty soon after the concussive event. And I think what we're gonna do is, is talk about these seven components in a little bit more detail. First and foremost is the neck, okay? Whiplash is very, very common and we all deal with that. And in my opinion, the neck is a huge source of headaches in these individuals. And I think where we need to start thinking about making, starting that treatment real early. Uh, in my opinion, these chronic headaches, a large majority of chronic headaches after a uh, history of concussions can be related to the neck as well. Um, and one of the important things is to understand um, where, the con where the headaches are and how that relates a little bit to anatomy and differentiating occipital and trigeminal headaches. I think a lot of times what we do see is trigeminal-based headaches that um, just throwing medication at is really not going to work. And I do believe that physical therapy holds a lot to that. And I think uh, making sure that you do your exam really well, which, which ATCs tend to do very, very well, is, make, is understanding that. But just kind of remember that the location of the headache does make a difference. If headaches are obviously occipital, that's occipital. But even vertex-based headaches and forehead, lower forehead headaches, are often related to the neck, okay? Um, a lot of times if you, you know, really talk to them about the headaches, do they have periorbital headaches where their pain is mostly around or behind the eye? That is a trigeminal-based headache. 
and the trigeminal nerve is obviously starting a bit complex here, goes through here, and you have the V1, V2, and the V3 branches. So a lot of times those headaches may be related to the neck, even if they're as far away from the neck as you can get on the head. And I think it's really important to, to pay attention to that. Um, it's missed oftentimes, um, but I do think with the proper treatment, um, we can kind of lower that and get those things recovered a lot quicker. And one of the things that kind of is, becomes a little bit interesting to me is this whole idea that the neck has a direct connection to the dura matter or to the brain. And a lot of the irritation from the neck can cause some of those headaches. So one of the things is to pay attention to is um, there's been a study that was out in 2016 where the rectus capitis posterior minor, that deep suboccipital musculature, is related to headaches post-concussion. And there's this whole, what we call the myodoral connection, where you have the rectus capitis posterior minor, and it has this uh, connection, this uh, PAL membrane that connects right to the dora matter. So if that muscle is tight, spasming, and pulling, you're going to pull on the door. If you pull on the door, you're going to have irritation around the brain. You're going to have headaches. Okay. So I do believe that understanding and working on the necks early on can have a big effect on treating a lot of the headaches that we see um, post concussively in these individuals. Okay. And that's my whole point is is just that whole uh, the idea of treating that neck earlier on really working on some of that suboccipital musculature to help that. And the other thing that that raises this whole idea of neck strengthening and as a way of preventing uh, not only concussions, but the headaches that we see post-concussively with that. And I do just want to take a couple of minutes to, to go over that. I do have a whole, actually a whole hour talk on, on the neck and, and concussions. But the bottom line is, what we do know is that neck girth Okay, end strength equals lower magnitudes, lower movement of the head, okay? The neck muscles can respond very quickly to any impact or load to the head. And what we do know is that if you have a wider, stronger neck, um, it's gonna reduce the amount of bobbing that the head goes through. And you have to think about movement this way, this way, but more, also more importantly, you have to think about torque and twist. Okay, torque is very, very critical in causing concussions. Most concussions, a lot of times, come from the head torquing very quickly um, this way, rather than just kind of banging back and forth that way. So we do know that that's critical, and it's, I think it's very, very important as, as a way of actually preventing headaches and concussions. Um, we do know that males in general have larger neck girth and strength. Um, and that's something that I always focus on the women, on our women athletes, particularly women in uh, soccer, have uh, weaker necks. And just a couple of studies that I want to help bear this out. Uh, we'll show this. This was a study done in um, Canadian ice hockey, uh, 11 to 14 year olds. And this is kind of what I, felt, I find very, very interesting. This is all preseason. That they use the scat uh, as a baseline. And what you can see is that if they had a history of preseason headache, Preseason neck pain or preseason dizziness, what you saw was an increased risk of concussion in that season. Okay, um, each one alone is about 1.5 around that range. If you combined any three of these, the, the risk of concussion more than doubles. Okay. And it's saying something, that something's going on with these individuals. Now, it's not clear from the study what that means. Does that mean they were concussed preseason and that's all they were reporting? Or is there something else going on with a weakness in the neck that led to that concussive event in the season? So that's something that I found kind of very, very interesting. And here's another one. We were asked a lot of times, you know, I'm always asked, does soccer headgear make a difference? And what you found is um, actually something rather surprising, where what we do know is that males um, have a lower movement of head um, in, in, in response to a load. So if they're taking on a soccer ball, if they're heading a soccer ball, men definitely have decreased um, acceleration and women are higher. But when the men put on the, hot, the soccer head gear, that 
speed of movement of acceleration actually went down a little bit. But for the women, when they put on the headgear, it went up. So the headgear for women added weight and um, diameter that made the head more pliable, which increased acceleration, which potentially can increase risk of concussion. So a lot of times, if, you, if women are going to wear headgear, they need to have stronger necks in order to hold that load. Even though it's a very light weight, it still needs something that um, you can see that the women are having a higher acceleration applied to them with the uh, soccer headgears on. So it was kind of an interesting idea there. And lastly, what's kind of interesting is it doesn't take a lot of money for athletic trainers to assess neck strength in their athletes. Um, I think with uh, in this Collins article from 2014, I think it's about $40 to $50, you can buy enough equipment to accurately measure neck strength in your population, uh, at least at the high school level. Uh, and again, it's, it's very, very gender dependent uh, in terms of neck strength as well. Um, but one of the interesting things that you can see is when, if you looked at concussed athletes relative to non-concussed athletes, the concussed athletes all had indicators of weaker necks, okay? And so again, it comes down to this whole idea of just a pre-season and in-season neck strengthening program for all athletes to help reduce neck injuries as well as concussive events, okay? And in this Collins study, what they found in preseason is that a 5% decrease in concussion rate for every one pound increase in neck strength. Okay? That's a lot. That's a lot. If you can work on a preseason program where they can get a one and a half to two pound increase, you can significantly reduce the risk of concussion in that population. And I really think that high school females are, are very, very appropriate for something like this, where, again, developmentally, women's heads develop and grow younger and faster than men do. Okay, so what happens in, at least in the high school female population, they have a larger head to neck ratio, okay, than men do. Um, and again, and women athletes aren't necessarily out there building up their necks, their traps, and, and all of that stuff. So I think that, that doing this for women would make a big, big difference for them in their sports. Um, if you do uh, isometrics, there's a whole bunch of different programs that, that you can do for this, but it has to be in all planes. Again, this whole idea of torque and being able to withstand movement from um, left to right and laterally is very, very important. Programs that only worked on strength and inflection and extension did show that reduction in concussion as well as programs that use the lateral movements as well. Okay. Um, I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time, but I would recommend looking up this article by Hillsong. Um And it was a very intensive program that they used for rugby. Um, and, and there was a couple different phases, and there were 20 minute phases, and those that spent doing that three times a week or more really, really showed a significant increase. And this was a pretty intensive program where it worked on neck strengthening, but it also worked on balance and agility. Um, and in what they were able to ultimately show is significant reductions in just about all types of injuries with this type of program. Um, and, and it's a pretty time intensive. It does take 20 minutes prior to each practice, and there's this whole preseason program. But the bottom line is you can reduce every type of injury um, in the neck, a lower extremity, <coughs> concussions. Um, it would significantly better for the teams in the long run of being able to do it. So I'm all for these preseason programs and even during seasons that are definitely going to work on the neck strength and as well as, as agility drills to help reduce the level of concussions. Okay. Now, if we switch over to vestibular and ocular, um, how many people, when you're working with your athletes, will do a lot of vestibular or ocular either assessments or treatments? I know it's becoming a little bit more popular. So we have a few people out there. And then what I'm finding is, at least acutely, it's a, it's a big deal. It becomes a big deal because um, of kids trying to get back into school. 
and the whole idea of not missing too much school or falling too far behind. So I do find it something that I've, I've become a little, a lot more interested in. And well, first we'll talk about vestibular. And first of all, when you think about vestibular, remember there's two distinct vestibular systems. The vestibular balance, which we're all familiar with with the best and kind of just holding that up. And there's vestibular ocular, and those two need to, to definitely be separated from each other. So this is the balance that I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with, with the best system and the modified best. Um, is the most, most common way of, of measuring balance uh, post-concussion. And then you can do, um, Sway has a nice uh, app uh, that goes off of the phone uh, as well. And then you also have force plate as well. Um, and what's interesting here is, is balance is very important. Um, people haven't paid too much attention to it. Um, initially it was used to help diagnose concussions and now we don't depend upon it as much to do that. But I think it's very important to when we're getting them back um, and, and one of the reasons that I think it, it, it's very important to make sure that the balance is back to normal is there's this whole body of literature that we're starting to look at where what they are showing is a higher risk of lower extremity injury after a concussion. Anywhere from the next week to one year out. Okay? And that's kind of interesting, and, and, and it's not clear why, and, and actually we're, for Rice, <coughs> we're actually in the middle of looking at their data over the last five years to see if that's the case. I would not have predicted that, okay? So it's something that we're becoming very interested in. Um, I do know for a lot of the pro football players that we follow, we do force plate uh, uh, balance, and we do see a significant drop in that um, within the first week or two after the concussion. So we are paying a little bit more attention to that to prevent any of those injuries. So um, it's something that I would, would pay attention to with, with your athletes. Now if we switch over to the vestibular ocular stuff, um, it's very, very common in acutely. You will see it very, very often if you're looking for it. Excuse me. Um, and um, close to about 80% or so will have it. Now the thing about vestibular is it's just not vertical. It's just not always a spinning sensation. In fact, true vertigo, in my opinion, I don't see that a ton. What I have is, is the term I, I ask my patients is a rocky boat. Does it feel unstable to you? Okay, and that's more what I get. And you can ask them, you know, how's it feel when you're driving in a car or being in an elevator or going downstairs? They're the type of questions that you want to ask um, about. And the other thing is, is if they do have a history of motion sickness, if they're prone to getting car sickness or you know, airplane sickness as a young kid, they're a little bit more prone to, to having this. And what happens is it's this whole disconnect between eye movements and head movements, and which is all what motion sickness is about, okay? There is a reflex loop between the eyes and your balance system so that I, uh, my eyes can follow wherever my head goes or if I wanna fix my head and do something like that without getting a mismatch of information. So that's a big source. And what happens is it, it counts for fatigue, headache, nausea, um, cognitive problems. If you have constantly this sense of, of feeling off, it will wear on you throughout the day. If any of you have had motion sickness, if you've ever been car sick or sick on a boat or anything like that, you kind of know how that feels. And feeling that way for a couple of days does make it very, very hard for a lot of this. So it does impact mood, it does impact school, um, exercising and driving. And if you feel that you're athletes do have any of these issues, then I'd be very careful about, about the driving. Um, in the breakout labs that we have later, I will go over the bombs, the vestibular ocular motor screen in a little bit more detail. I think it's a nice little way of you guys being able to pay attention to this with, with some of your athletes, okay? Now, you've shown that they have a little vestibular disorder, things like that. What I've been doing is offering them some home exercises. I've been working with them and teaching them some home exercises to try to counter that a little bit earlier on. So teaching them the Epley home exercises, the Grand Daroff exercises, to kind of combat that a little bit. <clears throat> you know, I will spend 15, 20 minutes going over that with them in my office or putting them on a bench 
and, and making sure that they can do those types of things. There's some really nice YouTube videos that will demonstrate how to do some of these exercises. So think about something like that and having them doing this at home a little bit. Consider vestibular therapy earlier on. If my patients are still relatively symptomatic two weeks, I will talk to them about uh, vestibular therapy. Um, there are a lot of nice programs around the country that are teaching vestibular rehab techniques. If that's something you might be interested in learning, I would highly, highly recommend thinking about doing it. Um, and that's something to consider. And the last thing is, again, if you feel there is a vestibular issue, be very, very careful about allowing them to drive. Um, going downstairs is a little bit more of an issue than going upstairs. Um, I've had one patient that actually fell in the shower, so I'd be real, real careful about some of those things and just kind of warning them about that. But think about starting some of those home exercises a little bit earlier on with your patients. Now, very, very similar to a lot of the vestibular stuff are now ocular motor deficits, okay? Eye movement kind of impairments. And when, with the eye movements that we do have three planes that we're looking at, saccades, which are the uh, literal eye movements of I want to look left, I want to look right, up and down, and things like that. There's virgins kind of moving your eyes in and out to focus on something and pursue, just following a moving object. They're all very distinct types of ocular motor abilities and on, can all be affected in the concussion. And this is where they might report that after a couple of minutes of reading, I get a headache, things start to look blurry to me a little bit. Um, I have trouble focusing when I'm in class, when I'm reading, things like that. These are the type of symptoms that might suggest that they have a little bit of a problem with this. If they do have an oculomotor deficit, it absolutely will impact their academics or your ability to work. You're not gonna be able to look at that screen for too long without being um, affected and your symptoms kind of getting a little bit worse. You know, the virgins issue, if you're looking down at your desk on your laptop or you're writing notes, you have, you know, maybe foot and a half, and then if you have to look up at the teacher or the whiteboard, and then now you're 10, 15 feet away, that ability to change that virgins, of, of kind of um, near point and far point virgins, can be very, very challenging. And then reading is all saccades. You're left to right, left to right, left to right, and you're constantly moving your eyes left to right and then up and down. So these can be very common um, problems that will impact their ability to do their work or, or function at school. And again, this is uh, where the bombs, the vestibular ocular motor screen is, uh, can be very, very helpful in pulling that out. And just I'll go over real quick and then we'll talk a little bit more about it in the breakout. But if you use the bombs about 60 to 70% acutely, so within the first 72 hours, we'll show some of the vestibular ocular and the ocular motor deficits. What's really nice is a lot of these symptoms are very low rate occurring in the normal population. So usually about less than 10% will have any vestibular ocular or true ocular motor symptoms. The only exception to that is near point convergence. So if I'm looking at my finger and I keep bringing it in and I'm getting near point convergence, you know, at what point do my eyes break and I start to see double? Okay, and normal is about five centimeters. Okay, so close to about two inches. So you'd be able to really go like this. But what you'll see is about a fifth of the population are much further out than that. And what you'll see is that there's a small subset where normal is their normal is actually abnormal, and they don't have it. They've just learned to adapt to it. Um, but it's a good set of tests that we'll go over a little bit more in the breakout and talking about that. One of my interests have expanded a little bit into ocular motor um, and trying to figure out ways of rehabbing that a little bit quicker. Um, and there's some newer technology that's starting to come out. A lot of it is FDA approved to um, very precisely and accurately measure ocular motor movements. And there's three right here. There's probably some more. There's SyncThink, um, which is, um, uses Google Glasses. There's right eye, which is a, a, a self-standing um, 
laptop, uh, computer, and there's Oculus Book, uh, which has a very, very sophisticated piece of equipment. All have their pros and cons, but what I would like to show you is an example of how this has played out. Here's a female, 17-year-old female I saw, basketball concussion just very, very recently. Um, she got knocked down, went back, um, arms got wrapped up and head hit the back of the court, okay? So she was concussed. I see her two days after the concussions. And this is, the, um, this is from her smooth pursuits, okay? So the blue line represents the tracing of her eye and all her eye was doing was following a red dot that moved in a clockwise circle, okay? Um, and it shouldn't be too hard to see how abnormal that is. All her eyes have to do is follow this smooth red dot, okay? And you can see where the eye is not able to do that and it's very, very jumpy and moving around and at times where she's supposed to be down here, it cuts across and you can see that um, she's very, very off. So it was two days after that, we started some mild eye exercises with her and then I see her five days later in follow-up and what you start to see is some normalization of those eye movements. Um, things are kind of coming back a little bit. And then um, my final follow-up was just uh, uh, a week and a half ago. And you can see how she's returned back to normal on that. So we do see this a lot. And this is my attempt where to try to get them back so that school becomes a little bit easier for them so they don't fall too far behind a lot of the time. Okay. And another way that's, that was the smooth pursuit, these are the saccades that are done in both the um, vertical and the horizontal plane. And what you can see is looking up is a very challenging effort for, for most human beings. You can always typically feel a little bit of more pressure. And what you can see here is when she's looking up, instead of being able to maintain that, following that red dot straight up and stopping at the end point, you can see where the eyes, excuse me, where the eyes are kind of breaking off and moving over here a little bit in the left eye and then the right eye, and how you have a little bit more separation. And what you can see is over time, it starts to normalize a lot. Uh, left to right movements here as horizontal, and you can see how difficult it was for her for just to kind of go left and right and keep her eyes steady. And there was a big, big breakdown in her eye movements, and we worked on that a little bit over time. And it's still not 100% better, but you can see it's a lot better where you don't have the width or the scatter here that we had originally. So it's something that I've been working on a little bit more and, and just pay attention to the symptom reportings. You know, if they're having a lot, a lot of difficulties with their reading and that's what's provoking a lot of their symptoms, then you're likely probably in an ocular motor type of deficit and something to, to think about in treating. Um, some of the home stuff that I've been giving them, um, the whole bunch of stuff, different stuff that you can do. Uh, one of them is um, this uh, online program, um, which is called I Can Learn. And what you can see is, does it pop up here? What you can see here is if you go under tracking, there are a whole bunch of really simple kind of tasks that you can easily start at home with them. So something like, uh, this one, and all they have to do here is follow um, the bug, and if you have them do this for two minutes at a time, take a minute break, you can see that they actually have to work on tracking that type of object as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different types of things that one can do here, um, and it's something to, to really think about a little bit with your population as well. Cognitive stuff. Okay. Many of you are familiar with the computerized testing that, that's been used for concussions. Right. Sure. Um, some of the more common ones impact uh, C3 logic and CNS vital signs are probably the three most common ones used. Um, they measure attention, reaction time, and memory. Usually those types of deficits are pretty strong in the first 48 to 72 hours, and we do see that, but usually after that, those they start to taper off a little bit. Um, if you're going to do this, then I do recommend that you, stay, you stick with ones that are, um, have good psychometric properties, have been on the market for a little while. Uh, be very, very careful about the interpretation. It's just not looking at a red or a green stop sign. Uh, it does take a little bit of skill, so I, I am uh, kind of 
leery about just using a cookie cutter approach to interpreting it. Please remember the environment and the motivation of the student make all the difference in the world. If you're going to be administering these tests, they do need to be done in a quiet environment without a lot of distractions. Um, and they do need, uh, so that's, it's important to do that. Um, the way I tend to use a lot of these is not to help diagnose the concussion, but it's as a return to play clearance, okay? So one of the final things that they do have to do is be able to show me that they're cognitively intact. Okay, so I don't feel it helps a lot with the diagnosis, but I do feel it helps a lot with proving that they're ready to go back to play. Okay. Um, there's a lot of debate now about whether baseline testing is required. Um, I kind of think of it, I don't think of it as a necessity, I think of it as a luxury. Um, so we can use the normative data that um, many of these softwares do have. Um, so it's something to think about where a lot of the schools used to demand baselines and now um, I'm more accepting to, to treat it as a luxury rather than a necessity. Symptom reporting. Um, I'm sure you've all done symptom reporting after concussions. Uh, it's something that I do like to do and I do like to track with them over time. Um, please remember that you can look at a structure or uh, factor analysis of the symptoms, and you can look at maybe four different ways of looking at the symptoms. You have a sleep component, you have a somatic, that's photophobia, phonophobia, the dizziness, um, and then you also have an emotional component, so that's the sadness, depression, the anxiety, and then they group migraine, headache, and fatigue, and cognitive into one. So this is typically post-concussion, how the symptoms break down, and if you administer, what I like to use is the post-concussion symptom scale. If you look at it, you can kind of get a sense of the factor loadings and decide how to go about treating the individual a little bit better and just monitoring it. Symptoms should improve over time. If they do not, think about factors that might affect that as well. Um, you know, it could be psychological, they could be overdoing it, but after the first 48 hours, I know we're always concerned about a bleed and things like that, but after the first 48 hours, symptoms should start to go down. If they're not and they kind of continue to go up, you have to understand why, and that's where you might take a little bit more time to talk to your athlete about that. Um, females tend to have greater symptom reporting, the baseline, uh, ADHD, uh, LD, depression, anxiety, also have higher symptom reportings at baseline, so you will have those factors to deal with as well, okay? Emotional and psychological factors do play into it sometimes. Um, we do have some kids that um, are a little overly sensitive to concussions, um, and you need to just think about that a little bit. Um, exercise withdrawal, um, you do see that if your athlete has been exercising a couple of hours every day, gets a concussion, and then they stop exercising like that, you do have that exercise withdrawal symptomatology to deal with in the first couple of days. Anxiety, depression, poor sleep, all of those things will add into it a little bit, so do pay attention to, to some of that. Um, every once in a while, we get these high achieving students that are a little bit stressed out about missing their work a little bit. So just kind of talk to them. Um, I always find out that the athletic, I always find that the athletic trainers know these student athletes better than anyone else. So I often kind of go to them a little bit to help me out with a lot of that. The last section that I do want to talk about a little bit is autonomic dysfunction. And this is something that doesn't become an issue a lot, but there are some important factors that I do want to talk about it. Concussions can cause autonomic dysfunction. The, the idea being is in a torque where the head kind of goes this way, the straining on the long fibers that connect brainstem and midbrain to cortex, okay? Um, that's often where loss of consciousness kind of comes from a lot of times. <clears throat> if that happens, then the cortex and the brainstem aren't communicating very well. Autonomic function is controlled by brainstem, but if the cortex can't control it, then you can have autonomic dysfunction, and that's an imbalance of sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The things that it affects a lot of the times tends to be heart rate, okay? 
So what happens is, you know, orthostasis, where after a concussion, they stand up too quick, they kind of get lightheaded, okay? That's a perfect example of autonomic dysfunction that's taking place, all right? So one of the things that we do see is that there are ways of looking at this where acutely, um, you will see autonomic dysfunction in the first couple of days, but we do have a small percentage that have prolonged autonomic dysfunction, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things that it does, it affects how the heart beats. So we have something called heart rate variability. So from beat to beat, the time between, if your heart beats 60 times in a minute, there isn't one second between each beat, okay? It varies, and that variability is normal, and that's actually very, very healthy. But when that variability is decreased because of the imbalance between parasympathetic and sympathetic, then you have um, changes in oxygenation and blood flow and, and, and cardiopulmonary resistance, um, and you are now looking at autonomic dysfunction in that often. Um, here are all of the symptoms that are, tend to be associated with dysautonomia. The red ones are the ones that I tend to think I see a little bit more in um, the concussed population. Um, so you have orthostatic hypotension, that or syncope, or even that sense of standing up and getting lightheaded um, when they stand up. Blurred double vision, exercise intolerance, feeling winded. If your athlete says, you know, they can walk up a flight of stairs and they're huffing and puffing or they feel winded in that, that's an example of autonomic dysfunction and heart rate variability. Dizziness, tachycardia, bradycardia, or changes in, heart, in, in baseline heart rate, uh, feeling weak as well, are very, very common. If you looked at concussed athletes versus controls, you see a whole bunch of changes in autonomic function. You can see an increase in systolic blood pressure and heart rate, um, slower recovery of systolic blood pressure, um, changes in heart rate from supine to standing as well. Um, athletes soon after concussion will have higher steady state exercise heart rate, so the heart is going to be faster in response to exercising, um, and that's why they're going to have poor endurance and higher perceived exertion as well. In the brain, we see changes in cerebral autoregulation. That's how the brain adjusts oxygen to different parts of the brain. Um, we see changes in that acutely. And pulmonary ventilation, basically, you have a little bit more constriction going on, and that means more CO2 is going to be in the lungs than oxygen and get this whole issue of getting that up to the brain as well. So acutely, we do see a lot of that. Um, now, um, and there are you know, a whole bunch of different ways of assessing that. Uh, you can do orthostatic blood pressure, exercise intolerance, Valsalva. You can measure heart rate variability in the head up tilt table. So a lot of different ways of doing it. A lot of the times what we kind of do is exercise intolerance and do some of this. Um, but one of the ways that we've been measuring this a little bit more is how many have heard of a buffalo concussion treadmill test? A few? Yeah. So this is an interesting one. Um, and what we've done is, is use this to determine if the deficit is autonomic based uh, in the player with prolonged concussion related symptoms. Okay? And what we'll do with this one is um, Letty, uh, J, J. J. Letty uh, is a sports med doc that, that kind of created this. And what we're trying to do is use physiological measures to determine if exercising is autonomic related and, and if that's accounting for a lot of the concussions, okay? And so what we're doing here is a modified bulk cardiac treadmill protocol, okay? You need a treadmill, you need to be able to measure heart rate and blood pressure, okay? And that's what you have. And what you're doing is you're starting on the treadmill 3.6 miles per hour flat and then you start this gradual increase in um, intensity on the treadmill first by inclining at two degrees and then a degree after that. And then if um, they are still going, then you start to increase speed a little bit. Um, and what you basically do is you establish their basal heart rate. So what heart rate do they become symptomatic? Okay, and that becomes, and then so as soon as you put them on the protocol, on the treadmill, you're gonna measure their heart rate, their blood pressure. You're gonna ask them to rate 
how symptomatic do they feel at that time, zero to 10, okay? So then you have that all set up, and if they're highly symptomatic, then obviously you don't want to be running them on the treadmill. But then every two minutes, you're going to measure heart rate, blood pressure, and perceived exertional stress using the board scale. Okay? And what you'll see is they're going to go along on the exercise, everything's fine, and then if it is truly autonomic, there is going to be a point where it breaks. Heart rate's going to go way up, blood pressure's going to go way up, or the perceived exertion is going to go through the roof. And that is the point where what we do is we take off about 10, 15%. That's the level of exercise that we put them on for a couple of days, and then we start gradually increasing it from there to try to retrain the autonomic system to accept um, and to get back into normal, okay? So we've had some good success with this. Um, the thing about autonomic dysfunction, very, very tricky to treat. Um, it does take a little while to do it, um, and sometimes we just have individuals that just don't recover. It can take them months to a year to get better from, from autonomic dysfunction after concussion. But we have used this. Um, if they continue to exercise and they make it all the way through to the end, they have the 15 minutes or 20 minutes that they're chugging along and they have no change in symptoms, it's not autonomic. It's something else. So that's what we're using the test for is to rule in or rule out on autonomic dysfunction. And then we have to start figuring out, is it vestibular, is it emotional? A um, couple of other, other options, is it uh, neck? So we have a couple of other options. We try to use this to, to do that. You do stop the test if their perceived um, symptomatology worsens by three or if they make it all the way or their perceived exertion is <coughs> as well, okay? Now, uh, we do see this, um, that we do are seeing some autonomic dysfunction, and a lot of times that's for the, those individuals that don't get better, so we do try to do it to rule out autonomic and think about physiological, psychological, cervicogenic, or vestibular issues as well. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of adding exercise early in recovery. Okay, I know that we all have this return to play exercise protocol to clear them, but there's also exercise as treatment. And I urge you to start that exercise early on in the, in the recovery of the individuals to help them get better. Usually about 72 hours or three or four days after a concussion, I will start doing some exercise, even if it's a 15 minute walk. Um, that's something. And I think that starts to help promote recovery um, physically and, and I also believe emotionally because now they're doing something to get better a little bit. Is that when you would uh, start like the whiplash or neck therapy as well? After a couple of days. You know, if the neck is really tight and inflamed, you definitely want to bring that inflammation down. And then after 48 hours, you know, you can start incorporating non-steroidals, ice, heat, massage, yes. Um, but usually about 72 hours, if their symptoms aren't super, super high, so on that post-concussive scale, if their symptom score is 20 or below, then I'll start, definitely start, start the exercise with that as well. All right, so please remember, concussions are a multi-system or multi injury that requires pretty comprehensive exam if you truly want to understand what's going on. The clinical profile will determine the trajectories and the treatment. So we talked about the seven components that we do see there. Um, think about neck strengthening as a